This is a follow-up to Everybody Missed the Point of Castaway. The first and second parts present all remaining evidence of the betrayal, and the third part is an exploration of the deeper subtext. First, my response is to the main criticisms of the betrayal theme, because the few people who did disagree seem to only have one of five things to say. So, I'll quickly put them to bed here, for my own sanity. Helen Hunt is just a bad actress. The most common criticism was that Helen Hunt is incapable of doing more than one smile, which somehow invalidates the entire theory. And the Oscar goes to Helen Hunt is as good as it gets. So, I think she gave a great performance in this film. And we can see a full range of smiles. And the winner is... And the winner is... And the winner is... Helen Hunt. Helen Hunt. But even if she were a bad actress... The winner is Helen Hunt. It doesn't matter. You could replace her with emojis, and it would not invalidate the intended emotions. So let me get one thing straight here. Kelly must have loved Chuck because she gave him the pocket watch. This was not a family heirloom, and actually represented Kelly's blasé attitude to lying. Seems like a real nice pager. First is the trivia, that it couldn't be a railroad watch, like she said. My granddaddy used it on the Southern Pacific. Second, when Chuck returned the watch, she didn't even thank him. She was surprised that he'd even kept it. Oh my god. In fact, Chuck had to remind her that she'd even said it was a family heirloom in the first place. I want you to have it. I gave it to you. That's a family heirloom and it should stay in your family. I'll be expanding on this in the next part, so I'll leave it at that for now. That's everything I have from when you went down to now. Kelly must have loved Chuck because she kept everything from Chuck's disappearance. This is only stuff from the four weeks between his rescue and arrival in Tennessee. I mean, this map works back to locate Chuck's Island, so Kelly probably copied it straight from the news or one of these magazines. You're just an ist who's spreading ism. The theory is that Kelly cheated on Chuck, and not that every woman cheated on Chuck. <laughs> Any questions? Uh... You're jumping to conclusions based on circumstantial evidence. A pet peeve of mine is that there is nothing wrong with circumstantial evidence. Every day, people are convicted of crimes based on circumstantial evidence. Anyway, in film analysis, you rarely have any other kind of evidence to go on. The exception would be something like Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 film, Psycho, which ended with a psychiatrist explaining the film to the audience in a 20-minute monologue. Suffice it to say, the ending suffers for this, and it's since been taken as a lesson on how not to end the film. Did he talk to you? No. What if Rob Zemeckis, William Broyles Jr., Tom Hanks, etc., said that this theory is wrong? Well, it would not be a great experience to have Rob Zemeckis rock up to denounce my videos, say that my memes aren't funny, and call me a loser. I would not actually care if he did. It doesn't matter! This might sound counterintuitive, but the fact is that it's never clear if anybody has the right to speak up about the artistic intent behind the project. And uh, when they come out, there it is. Looks like the unicorn. And it means? That he's a replicant. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Also, I think that the studio sold on an upbeat Rob Zemeckis blockbuster, and he gave them a heartbreaking betrayal story instead. So, there might be a vested interest in announcing this theory. I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. Okay? The evidence for this is in comparing the film to the original script. It's all just happy-go-lucky nonsense, like Chuck, Kelly, and Stan reuniting in Hawaii with grins and laughter. There have been many genius comments, and I want to bring them to the forefront, so I will credit their username in the bottom left corner if I'm discussing their contributions. The timeline begins before the film starts, we have Kelly meeting Lovett while picking up Chuck after his root canal. Chuck, with his swollen face all bandaged up, 
probably medicated and in a wheelchair, striking a contrast with Mr. Big. Lovett probably gave Kelly his card to contact him with any questions about Chuck's surgery. After this, Kelly started cheating with Lovett whenever Chuck was away working. Hello, Kelly, are you there? Pick up, 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 you're not there. When Chuck tries to call Kelly, 8 minutes and 52 seconds into the film, there is a sound. I'm doing the sword in the middle of Red Square. In the shadow. Here's the audio waveform. Square. In the Castaway was nominated for Best Sound, so it's strange that this random sound is here. Square. In the shadow. I don't think it's a random sound at all. I think it sounds like a duck. Kelly is introduced, copying her dissertation with her back to Chuck and the audience, standing next to a caution radioactive material sign. Also, you have this frog making eye contact with Chuck, which could employ the boiling frog metaphor. I hate frogs. Then, you have this awkward statement. You're home. Home indeed. I love that you're home. I love that you're home. It's a strange thing to say. Hey, speaking of marriage, Chuck, when are you going to make an honest woman out of Kelly? I want to expand on this dinner scene, as a few people felt that it was necessary to explain the meaning of this phrase to me. What a heavy load Einstein must have had. <laughs> Fucking morons everywhere. <laughs> First, throughout most of the world, pointing is considered rude, and Kelly's uncle points at her, and later she points back at him. It is clear that this phrase is a pointed remark. Also, this choice of phrase declares to a table of relatives that things are premarital between Chuck and Kelly, which is at best a faux pas, and at worst an attempt to embarrass her. So, this employs a level of hostility, which makes it undeniable that this phrase was used to employ that Kelly is dishonest. Me. Hey, Kelly was married before? I also want to highlight that Kelly's family don't want to discuss her history. Yeah, no, you know what? It's not even worth remembering. Oh, my. I explained why the timepiece is not actually a family heirloom in the first part of this video. My granddaddy used it on the Southern Pacific. But I also want to discuss Kelly's possible motives behind giving Chuck this gift. Kelly time. <laughs> For a PhD student at Christmas, it's a cheap gift. Merry Christmas. I thought you were stiff. <laughs> no. You could find a cheap timepiece like this in any thrift store. Or worse, the university's lost and found. Lost and found box? <laughs> There's no lost and found box. There's an ass box. Also, giving him a gold watch might symbolize the fact that Kelly is going to be retiring Chuck soon. But she wants to show her appreciation for his hard work and dedication. It is a cheap gold watch, buddy. Aside from the timepiece, the fact that the photo is just her and not a photo of Chuck and Kelly together means that, emotionally, she was already separated from him and probably just wanted him to have something to remember her boy. You know, that <clears throat> reminds me, I almost forgot, I have one more present for you. Chuck giving Kelly an engagement ring without any ceremony and Kelly immediately recognizing it, stating, I'm Terrifying. Employs that marriage is already a bone of contention in their relationship. Just take it and hold on to it and you can open it on New Year's Eve. Chuck was giving Kelly an ultimatum with this ring. We get married or it's finished. Two things to note on the island. The film cuts from Chuck looking at Kelly to having a dump behind a bush. And later he opens a divorce decree. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say to her. What in the world am I going to say to her? Note the strange conversation with Chuck's friend, the pores, and the strange word. Chuck, Kelly had to let you go. Kelly had to let you go. Nobody has to do anything. Least of all, somebody in Kelly's situation. Unless she didn't have any money to support herself with or accidentally found herself in the family way. I'm Kelly's husband. This is Lovett's chickens coming home to roast. It's a rooster thumb. Kelly, uh... So Lovett is obviously marking his territory, 
And even so, he still can't bring himself to finish this sentence. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that I fed your ex. <laughs> Lovett performed surgery on Chuck five years ago. Chuck was missing for four years. Chuck, a character obsessed with time, is obviously figuring out the suspicious timeline for Kelly and Lovett's relationship. This drives him to confront the Lovett household. Chuck had no idea who would be in the house. He was ready to confront Lovett and Kelly both. How different would this have gone if Lovett opened the door and tried to get rid of him again? A commenter joked about how old it would be if Chuck had a gun on him during the whole scene, and this idea is just too funny not to mention. Sorry. Luckily, Kelly opened the door, and Chuck was ready to call her out right there, but got blindsided by a diffusing hug. I saw you down at the hub today, so I know you were down. Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! Let me get one thing straight here. This is the moment when Chuck lost the nerve to call Kelly out. However, the question he chooses instead also concerns betrayal. We have a pro football team now, but they're in Nashville. As a commenter explained, Memphis already had two failed pro football franchises and were snubbed for expansion. So, hearing a Memphis native say, We have a pro football team now, but they're in Nashville, echoes the city's feelings of betrayal. When Chuck returns the pocket watch, with Kelly forgetting that she said it was a family heirloom and Chuck having to remind her, I can't help but think that this would have been a perfect time for Kelly to return Chuck's engagement ring. Chuck says, I never should have gotten on that plane. I never should have gotten out of the car. Which sounds like an accusation, because Kelly should have stopped him. I never should have gotten out of the car. Recognizing Chuck's anger, Kelly distracts him with the revelation that she'd kept his jeep, and Chuck put it perfectly. All right, now, this is weird. <laughs> this is weird. She was obviously using it because it was gassed up, ready to drive, and she had all this stuff in it. So, she was using her dead boyfriend's jeep as her daily driver. I think she sold the engagement ring for gas money. Kelly tries to gaslight Chuck. You said you'd be right back. Chuck's apology doesn't sound sincere to me. It sounds sarcastic. I'm so sorry. Stan, I'm so sorry I wasn't around when Mary died. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. However, Kelly finally apologizes, albeit indirectly. Me too. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out! Hey, look! How it's being eaten! It's eaten? Makes you think, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, what's it all about? The lazy analysis of Castaway is that Chuck didn't appreciate his life and he needed four years alone on an island to change his ways. This is boilerplate for when a protagonist has a hard time and learns a lesson. I, I, I changed my mind. I want to live again. I want to live again. Whoa! But here it makes no sense because we are actually shown Chuck trying to call Kelly, dancing with Kelly, spending time with Kelly and her family, and proposing to Kelly. I'm... Terrifying. In the first video, I stated that the pain that Chuck that went, went through was not shown to us arbitrarily. Instead, Chuck's entire experience was a surrogate for Kelly's betrayal. I stand by this analysis, but why make a film about betrayal? I don't know why! I think the deeper meaning is like bad things happen to good people. Except in this case, it's more that bad people happen to good people. If you assess Kelly and Lovett's life together, on Kelly's side, she nonchalantly complains about everything. Her daughter is a handful. She's a beautiful little girl. She's a handful. She lives in a small house with a big mortgage. It's a nice house. Yeah, we got a nice mortgage too. She doesn't want to have more kids. Think you're gonna have more kids? I don't know. Kind of confusing right now. And she regrets not becoming a professor. When your plane went down. Everything just sort of got put on hold. I think about taking it up again, though. 
in the first video, I assumed the best for our love it side of it. Love it had feelings for Kelly beyond just an affair and took advantage of the tragedy to make a deeper relationship with her. However, Lovett is a dentist, and with that paycheck, you would think he could afford a bigger house and a fancier car. I mean, Kelly keeping Chuck's Jeep as a daily driver is evidence enough that they were strapped for cash. All right, now, this is weird. <laughs> My conclusion is that his previous family has the big house and the fancy car because of his affair with Kelly. So Kelly and Lovett didn't plan on being together and their marriage is a sham that's probably not going to last because since Chuck's return, Kelly's been lost. Kelly, uh, she's sort of lost. So. Love it has lost Kelly. It's it's confusing. It's kind of confusing right now. If he didn't know it when he spoke to Chuck, he knew it after Kelly woke him up screaming for Chuck and then kissed him in the middle of the road. Chuck is obviously a good person, but he doesn't seem to be great with people take the pilot he buries. Apparently, he didn't even know his name. Not Alan, Albert. He also seems prone to denial. Like, when talking about Stan's wife, he mentions setting up an appointment with some doctor who will just fix everything. I heard about this doctor down in Emory in Atlanta. Uh, he's supposed to be the absolute best. You know, he could get this thing fixed. He could beat it. Thanks, Chuck. So I'll get his number. So these traits could explain him never realizing and or accepting that he has an unfaithful girlfriend who's only using him to pay for her PhD. When are you defending your dissertation? January 12th. Chuck doesn't seem to have any family and he might be compensating by devoting himself to his job and relationship because at the start of the film, Chuck seems to be working hard to provide for the family he thinks he's going to have with Kelly someday. Kelly just can't see being with a man who wears a pager today. His capacity to project feelings and emotions where they don't exist is shown with Wilson. I'm coming. Just like imagining a friend in a volleyball, Chuck imagined the future with Kelly, but reality finally set in and the fantasy faded away. I kept the picture. It was all faded anyway. When the film ends, Chuck has learned a lot and he's taken things in his own time. Rules over us without mercy. He's delivering packages from the island and in the script, Bettina's package contained a letter to her husband expressing her hope that he might return. So if Chuck's time on the island was a surrogate for Kelly's betrayal, then Bettina's package represented his hope that he could escape the island and maybe one day love again. Good luck, cowboy. The fame is that bad things can happen to anybody, but if you're a good person, you can surmount the bad and still live a good life. Kelly and Lovett were bad people and their punishment is being stuck with each other. But Chuck and Bettina were good people and their prize is finally mating each other. You look lost. For the people saying that this film did not intend anything as deep as this, here's a quick breakdown of the character names. Chuck, as in throw something carelessly, or from the Germanic given name Charles, meaning free man. Nolan, as in no land, or noble. Kelly, from the Irish surname meaning bright-headed. Friars, a derivative of friars, which, like monks, are forbidden to marry. Jerry, meaning spear, which he shares with the famous rodent. Love it, either from the Anglo-Saxon wolf or the Gaelic rat. Richard, too easy. Stan, from the Old English for stone. Bettina, from the Italian Benedetta, meaning blessed. And feminine form of Benedict. Peterson, son of Peter, from the Greek meaning rock. So if you doubt that Chuck and Bettina end up together, note that Stan's given name is Stone, 
and Bettina's surname is Rock, while Kelly's surname is Freuer, and Bettina's given name is Benedict, as in a Benedictine monk. Thank you for watching. Castaway is also rich in other subtext and has many different themes, so I might decide to tackle another aspect of it at some point. Also, somebody might try to debunk all of this, in which case I'd be obliged to debunk their debunking video. In the meantime, I will be making other content as well. Character studies, reviews, fan theories, and so forth. So, please consider liking and subscribing, as there's lots more to come.